Right, very good. All right, we're glad that you're here this morning, Blessed Hope Baptist Church. I know with the uh, way things happened uh, last last week, we had trouble with the uh, with the streaming, and uh, uh, I think some of it got cut out. That uh, we are not an Episcopal church. We don't have we really don't like the trappings that are behind us. Uh, but uh, we're renting from another church, and so we uh, respect that. But we are a Bible-believing Baptist church, and uh, so please don't let the uh, trappings behind me uh, distract you from uh, what the message is all about. All right, if you have a Bible, I'd like to, for you to take to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we've been here for a few weeks, and uh, we'll be here for a little bit longer unless there's an interruption here or there, uh, but um, for the most part we're going to be trying to work our way through these passages. I'm not going to read the whole uh, section that we have in the weeks past, we're just going to start with uh, verse 1 and verse 2 uh, just to get to where we need to get. There's a lot of material for today. So, <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for today and for your blessings. Uh, thank you, Lord, for salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance of that salvation. Lord, that we don't have to sit and fret and worry about what our destination is. If we've trusted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, trusting in the blood alone as payment for our sins, then we have the assurance in knowing that we know for sure we're going to heaven when we die. And Lord, what a comfort that is. Uh, we can rejoice in that. And Lord, even when things are bad that are going on in our lives, uh, we can still rejoice that we're on our way to heaven. And so, Lord, we pray that we would uh, take counsel or comfort in that. And Lord, uh, just uh, allow us to be able to live on the victorious side simply because of that. So, Father, we ask your blessing upon the preaching of your word. Ask, Lord, that you'd fill me with your spirit, God, guide and direct and move in this service as you see fit. Pray, Lord, that I'd be sensitive to your spirit, not try to get ahead of you or behind you, uh, Lord, but do exactly what you'd have me to do. Father, pray for the hearts of these folks, Lord, that you'd minister to them and challenge them and help them, Lord God, to uh, desire to have a life and uh, a, a, a lifestyle that pleases you. So, Lord God, I pray that you'd be with them and minister to them and, and uh, uh, help them in this hour. Father, again, as we're minded to do, we're thankful for those men and women that serve in the armed services. Ask, Lord, that you'd protect them and keep them safe. Most of all, that you get the gospel to them. Lord, I pray for those that are saved within the military, that they'd be unashamed of the gospel and there'd be uh, bold witnesses for thee uh, to reap a harvest of souls for the glory of God. Lord, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for you. And uh, Lord, that we just want to tell you that we love you. And we appreciate your kindness and grace towards us. Uh, so, Lord, we pray that you'd bless this hour now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we have, uh, are in the midst of, of uh, the times that we've talked about prior to the rapture, just prior to the rapture of the church. And uh, Paul calls this time perilous times. A perilous, you know, we... we, we oftentimes think we know that word and probably will be confirmed that we do understand that word. Perilous means dangerous or hazardous or full of risks. And uh, we are living in days such as that. Certainly we shouldn't uh, take this admonition of, of Paul lightly or half-heartedly. Uh, as a child of God, uh, we don't want to be guilty of participating in the things that are characterized here in this list of things that Paul's gone through. And that's kind of the reason why I'm going through these things is because I want you to be aware of what 
is prevalent in the day and age that we're living in now so that you are not party to it, that we can distance ourselves from it. In fact, the admonition, if you take a look at the last part of verse 5, it says, from such, turn away. These things, and plus some of the other things that we'll talk about in weeks coming up, are things that we are to turn away from, we're not to be participants of, we're not to engage in, we're supposed to stay away from. Now the things that we've covered thus far is men shall be lovers of their own selves. We covered covetous, boasters, and proud, and we're now we're up to blasphemers. Blasphemers. We don't hear that term used very much. There was probably a time if you were in the Roman Catholic Church that you would hear that term from time to time. But uh, in days now that uh, in, in modern times and in, in modern churches, you don't hear the term blasphemy. It's kind of molded into uh, uh, some of the other terms that we use for, for uh, I guess you could say bad language or whatever. It might be uh, identified with cursing and some of the others. But there's some difference. And I think it's notable to make those difference because Paul makes the difference here. And you'll see the, the difference showing up in another verse here in just a moment. Uh, there is filthy communication. Filthy communication. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8, and you'll see the distinction in this verse. So, but now ye also put off all these. In other words, now that you're saved, that's the premise from which Paul is writing from in Colossians chapter 3. Now that you're saved, get rid of these things as well. He says, put off from all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. That filthy communication is dirty talk or talking dirty, uh, foul words, uh, often referred to as the four-letter words and things along that line. Filthy communication. Filthy communication can also be encompassed in telling dirty jokes or, or uh, uh, off-color jokes and so forth and <clears throat> that have, uh, you know, subliminal meanings to them, you know, kind of a, a polite way of telling a dirty joke. Some of those things the Bible tells us we are to put away from us filthy communication. Uh, cursing. Cursing is another one of those. It's using offensive words. In Romans chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Their throat is an open sepulcher, an open grave. With their, uh, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Someone who is angry, someone who is bitter, someone who is envious and, and just filled with that, that wickedness of bitterness uh, comes out and says things and hurts the, uh, that are offensive and hurt people and they curse people in, in, that, in that sense. In uh, uh, Psalm 59, it says this, For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. Uh, James, just one more verse on this. It says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so, uh, so to be. In other words, if you are to speak in a, in a form of blessing and kindness and, and humility out of your mouth, it shouldn't be used for the opposite with cursing and bitterness and so forth. Uh, one thing that where people will use the name in vain, uh, notice you, you know, most of the time they don't uh, take uh, Buddha's name in vain or they don't take Muhammad's name in vain. Uh, they don't take other names in vain, but when someone takes it in vain, it is using it in a, in a sense that is, is uh, how shall I say, one that lacks respect for the other. In, uh, we know this uh, from the Ten Commandments. The third commandment is found in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7. It says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold them, him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. This is most notably associated with asking God to damn something or to take the name of Jesus Christ when one is frustrated with something or someone. 
and they just blurt it out and they say those things. That's, that's a little bit different than cursing, although our terminology today kind of lumps them all together. Blasphemy is irreverent talk about God. And of course, irreverent would be disrespectful. So it's more like deriding God or belittling his attributes or questioning his authority. It's blatantly calling God out. It's blatantly uh, you know, attributing something that is not true about him or, some, or, or maybe saying something that would, um, how shall I say, um, not give him credit for something that he has done. We'll see some some things here. Maybe a a little bit more, I'll say, flowery definition of that that might help you understand it. Blasphemy and indignity offered to God by words or writing. Reproachful, contemptuous, or irreverent words uttered impiously against Jehovah. Another one closely resembling that. Blasphemy is an, an injury offered to God by denying that which is due and belonging to him, or attributing to him that which is not agreeable to his nature. In other words, saying something about him that is not true. Um, To give you an idea of some of that, we're going to take a look at some things in Scripture that show you and kind of give you an indication of what blasphemy is. And obviously these are things that we ought to take note of so that we don't participate in these things. But uh, in uh, Matthew 12, you have an incident where they bring to Jesus a man possessed with a deaf and dumb spirit. And when they bring this person to him, Jesus heals this person. And the people that are standing by and watching are amazed. And their comment is that, isn't this the Messiah? Isn't this the son of David? To which the, when, the, when the Pharisees heard it, in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 12, and when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth, doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So they're attributing the, the power from which God or Jesus Christ was able to cast out these spirits. They're giving it to the devil. The only way that Jesus Christ could do this is through the devil's power. Jesus responds to them in this way. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then this kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, By whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Then he makes this statement. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. So what they said when they attributed the fact that Jesus Christ cast out those devils by Beelzebub or the prince of the devils, they were committing blasphemy. Now, if you have this thought running through your mind, and many people do as soon as they hear this, the only way that you could actually commit this sin is by physically talking to Jesus Christ and telling him that he's casting out devils by Beelzebub. You can't do that now. He's not here. So don't have to worry about the sin against the Holy Ghost. You don't have to worry about that. But nonetheless, he identified it as blasphemy. There's another occasion where blasphemy is identified in the Gospel of John. Jesus Christ is speaking of uh, the discourse of of the Good Shepherd. And he says this towards the end of it. He says, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they, shall, uh, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 
My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. If he had stopped there, it probably would have been okay. But Jesus Christ goes on to say this, I and my Father are one. When he said this, you know what the Jews did? Those Pharisees, those pious Pharisees, that could not deny the miracles that Jesus Christ was doing, But you know what they did? The Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus Christ, he says, answered and says, many good works have I showed you from the Father. Which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered saying, for good works we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Here you have, as, uh, according to these Pharisees, Jesus Christ is mere man. They have not acknowledged the fact that he is the Messiah. And even if that thought is entertained in their mind, they realize that if they acknowledge him as the Messiah, they will lose position and authority with the Roman government and so forth and so on, and they're going to lose money and they're going to lose power. And uh, realizing how Jesus Christ has reacted to them when they tried to butter him up and he refused to be buttered up and bribed, they knew that they weren't in good, good graces with him and so therefore they were trying to get rid of him and therefore denied the fact that he was indeed the Messiah. The Jews recognized that one equating themselves with to be God or gods was a was equal to blasphemy. And of course, Jesus Christ, this isn't blasphemy for Jesus Christ because he is the Son of God. He is God manifest in the flesh. So for him to say, I and the Father are one, is not a false statement. He is not guilty of blasphemy. But there is one that uh, probably needs to be, um, how shall I say, um, brought up. Uh, uh, attention to. Take your Bible and go to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And uh, at the beginning of the chapter, you'll find out that that Herod has uh, already killed James, and uh, he has now grabbed Peter. He's put him into the prison. He intends to kill him on Easter, not on Passover. Uh, Passover uh, is a a certain day. Uh, You'll find out when Herod describes the the day Easter, it is the right one because it falls within the days of unleavened bread. So you have the Passover, then you have the days of unleavened bread, which are days following the Passover. And Easter for them, which is a pagan holiday, was found in the midst or in the middle of of those days of unleavened bread. So you know it wasn't Passover when, uh, when uh, P- uh, Peter was to be killed. So for those, uh, the reason why I make a big deal of that, or, or at least say something about that, is because there are people that say that, that uh, the word Easter should not be translated Easter, it should be translated Passover. And that would be incorrect. Because Passover happened a few days prior to the day that they call Easter which being a heathen holiday. And, uh, of course, they've taken it up in the church, and we call it Easter and so forth, and I'm not going to get into all that. But towards the end of that chapter, you have uh, Herod, which when he finds out that Peter's gotten out of jail and uh, all the doors are shut and all the guys are still there and it was a miraculous thing done by the angel of the Lord, and uh, Herod has all the people killed that were responsible for letting his prisoner go. You find this <clears throat> happening in Acts chapter 12 and verse 21. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, <clears throat> sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now, here he is, he's, he's receiving this accolade. Now, <clears throat> one thing in, in Herod 
That you have to understand, he was a Roman. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Roman. And uh, here he's receiving these accolades from these people that thought that his speech was so marvelous that it must have been, he must be one of the gods. And he did not correct them. He did not give God the glory. And when he spoke that way, he was uh, uh, stricken by God and eaten up on the inside by worms. Now, this ought to sound very familiar to you if you think about it. There's someone across the Atlantic Ocean that will sit on a throne. And when he speaks from that throne, he speaks the voice of God. He speaks what they, what they call ex cathedra. You realize when he puts that formal mitre on, of course they, they probably take it off because they've received too much heat, but in days gone by they used to have a, a plate on there which said vicarious filidi, which is Latin for saying uh, the vicar or the, or the son of God in the flesh or something like that. Something I, I don't have that exact, I don't speak Latin. But anyway, it is saying that he is the representative of God here on earth. In other words, equating himself with God. And here he is sitting on the throne. You know what that is? That's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. Just as this title is put on the miter, you know where they get it from? They get it from the Old Testament. But there's quite a difference. Here that, that uh, if I, I think I've, I've got something here with that vicarious filidi, I think they call it the vicar of Christ. And that's what that thing means. But they got that from someone else. The high priest in the Old Testament had a plate of gold with the words inscribed on it, holiness to the Lord. It wasn't declaring that he was God's representative here on earth. It was declaring holiness to God. It was giving glory to God. And therefore, it is not blasphemy. He's not trying to be a substitute for God. But there is a great counterfeiter. The devil. The devil himself shows his defiance his disrespect to God in blasphemy. Take your Bible and go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, pick it up in verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now this is a representative, this is the Antichrist coming up who has uh, kingdoms and kings that are in those kingdoms, and he is the head honcho. He's going to take over for them uh, during the tribulation time. That's what all that verse 1 was all about. Verse 2. And the beach, a beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth uh, as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the devil is the one responsible for this Antichrist coming to authority. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So the great imitator, just like Jesus Christ, this, this guy's going to get, a, this Antichrist is going to get a head wound. He's going to die. They're going to have him lying in state, and after the third day, he's going to rise again out of that casket and he's going to declare himself to be God. That's the Antichrist. At that moment, the devil will enter into him and he will be the devil incarnate, devil in flesh. That's what you're reading about here. Verse 4. There's other verses that support that, but I'm just trying to give you the cliff notes there. <clears throat> Verse 4, And they worship the dragon, 
which gave power unto the beast. So they're worshiping the devil. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? So they're worshiping the, the Antichrist here on this earth. Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That Antichrist is going to come in and hell on earth is going to take place and he is just going to be a, a ruthless dictator that is going to go after those who have, have received the Lord in the tribulation sense and the tribulation salvation, which is faith and works. Uh, it's uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ and keeping the commandments, both of them together. That's mentioned twice in Revelation chapter, I want to say 12 and 14, I believe it is. And you can look those verses up. It's not just faith alone, like you and I. It's faith and keeping the commandments. If they don't keep the commandments, they can lose their salvation. Which shows you that the verses that teach you can lose your salvation have a place in the Word of God. You just have to rightly divide it to make them, or allow them to fit. We're seeing the total disregard and disrespect of God. And it's culminating in all kinds of ways. We're seeing it in, in our schools where they're kicking God out of our schools. We're seeing it. I mean, what greater slight could, God, could you give to God by dismissing God as the creator and claiming our existence came through evolution? It's not giving God the glory. It's not giving him the glory that he is the creator and that he made all things. It is blasphemy. There's another kind of blasphemy that takes place. This is committed by human beings. Uh, if you can find it, 2 Chronicles chapter 32. I'm going to summarize. I'm not going to read the whole, sit, whole uh, situation to you. But I want you to, to understand. You can go back and take a look at it. It'll begin in verse 9. A king by the name of Sennacherib from Assyria has conquered the ten northern tribes of Israel and taken them and led them away captive. He's come back and now he's after Judah and Jerusalem. And he sent messenger by the name of Rabshiki to come and speak to the children of Israel up outside the wall of Jerusalem and speaking up to the, to the princes or rulers, uh, the, the, those that sit in the gates, and any of the people that are up on the wall to try to uh, uh, intimidate them and scare them. And we see this in, in um, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 9, And after this did Sennacherib, king of Syria, send his servants to Jerusalem. But he himself laid at siege, siege against Lachish and all his power with him. So all of his army is over there at Lachish, but he sends these ambassadors if you call them ambassadors, to go over there. Unto Hezekiah, the king of Judah, and unto all Judah that were at Jerusalem, saying, and of course that, and we're not going to go through the whole thing, but the spokesman again is Rabshiki. And um, they come up there and they say something along this line. Take a look at verse 14. And there's a lot of things going on there, but this kind of capsulizes it. Uh, who was there among the gods? No, so he, this guy's been bragging about Sennacherib and nobody's been able to, to go against them and defeat them. And they've taken down all the other gods of these other kingdoms and he's just lifting himself up. And that's what this verse is about. Who was there among all the gods of, the, of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could, del uh, that could deliver his people out of mine hand? that your God should be able to deliver you out of my hand. So in other words, those other gods couldn't deliver, you, uh, deliver them out of my hand, neither is your God going to be able to deliver you out of my hand. So he's bragging and he's boasting. 
And he's claiming that his gods are greater than the gods of Israel. Take a look at verse 16. And his servants spake yet more against the Lord God and against the servants of Hezekiah. Verse 17. He wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel and, he, and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of the other lands uh, have not delivered their people in the, uh, out of my hand, so shall not the, uh, the God of Hezekiah deliver the people out of my hand. One more, verse 19. And they spake against God, the God of Jerusalem, as against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of the hands of man. Now, you don't see the word blasphemy there. But the companion passage found in, in uh, uh, 2 Kings chapter 19. 18 and 19 tell you the story. 18 is all about this, this Rabshiki going up there and defying God and saying all these ungodly things. And chapter 19 is what happens or begins uh, with what happens right after that when those emissaries from Hezekiah, Hezekiah's uh, 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 men, if you will, have heard the message and Hezekiah is back in the palace and they go and tell Hezekiah what, what's, what, these, what Ramshiki has said and how he's disheartening the people on the wall and so forth. And so what, what Hezekiah says, look, tell you what, go tell this message to Isaiah the prophet. Go tell Isaiah. And so this is what it says there in, in chapter 19, verse 6. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say to your master, that would be Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the kings of Assyria have blasphemed me. So when they were bragging about their gods against the God of Israel, they were as much blaspheming God, and they were denying Him and defying Him. Something that we ought to be aware of. Now, you know where else that you can maybe make application, although it doesn't say blasphemy in the context. But you remember there was a giant that came against Israel and was calling out for a champion to come on and do battle with him in Second Samuel or First Samuel chapter 17 by the name of Goliath. And he defied the God of Israel. And David says, you know, the, the, uh, Goliath tells him, I'm going to pick you apart. You know, your God's not going to help you and so forth. David says, I come in the name of the Lord God of Israel. He says, the battle's his, it's not mine. And that was the proper way to reproach that. You give God the glory. You don't take it for yourself. Now, like I said, we should be aware of showing respect to God and give him the glory. In Mark chapter 7, the Lord Jesus Christ gives a list of sins that come from the heart of man. And uh, these sins defile the person or makes them dirty and sinful in the sight of God. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want to give you just a few of them here. In, in Mark chapter 7, verse 20, it says, And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. In other words, that comes out of your mouth. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, Deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Now just because you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior didn't mean that your heart is cleaned up along with it. Your spirit is saved. It is, it is made alive again. Your soul is cut loose from your flesh and it is redeemed. 
but your body is still in trouble. Your body still sins. And one of the sins that you and I are capable of is the sin of blasphemy. And how should that be? Simply, you could not give God the glory. You could take credit for something on your own instead of giving God the credit for it. Now, there are some things that Christians need to take care of and get out of their lives as soon as they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Take your Bible and go to Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to make application, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to set up a framework, a groundwork, for you to understand, first of all, what blasphemy is, but second of all, to understand how serious it is. Paul has gone through in this, in this uh, uh, Colossians chapter 3 and he's named some, some outward sin. He talks about fornication, adultery, and uncleanness and all this kind of stuff that, that is uh, 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 functions of the flesh itself, the body. Now he's going to start getting into some things that are internal. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, mortify, which means put to death, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now, in addition to this, but now ye also put off all these, the internal ones, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. And of course we read this verse before, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds. The thing is, is that we need to clean up after we get saved. If we don't clean up, we'll cause a real great problem, not only for Christians, but for the world. And this is how it relates to the church today. I want you to take your Bible and I want you to go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. We know the story of David's great transgression. And thankfully David confessed his sin when he was confronted and he was forgiven. But there was something that carried on. The ramification of David's sin Not only was there the ramifications that went on in his families by the judgment of David, four sheep for a sheep, and we know that there were four uh, sons, if you will, or four men that died in the family of David because of David's sin and his own pronouncement of judgment. But there was something else that took place. I think one thing that displeased God more than anything else about what David did. Take a look in verse 14. How be it because of this deed, talking about his adultery with Bathsheba, how be it because of this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee surely shall die. Because of what David did, and it was not secret, because of that, it gave great occasion for the enemies of David, either within his realm or outside of his realm, to blaspheme against God. Yeah, David's a man after God's own heart, who doesn't think that that, uh, the law applies to him, it only applies to me. He can do whatever he wants. He's a hypocrite. He tells me to trust in God, but he doesn't trust in God. He doesn't trust the law. He says he believes in the law, that he, that he violates the law. And they speak against God. Now, I want you to go back to Romans chapter 2 and follow with me here because what Paul does is he takes and shows the hypocrisy of the nation of Israel here in Romans chapter 2, which is exactly the case of which David was guilty. 
And by comparison, I want to show you that this is exactly what the church is doing today. This isn't isolated to the nation of Israel and say, well, yeah, the nation of Israel, they were really bad and stuff like that. You have to read between the lines because Paul is giving this illustration to show you exactly what's going on in the church today. Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Which is the Jew. The Jews, they knew they were the chosen people. They, they, they were the, the chosen ones. They were better than all the other nations and so forth. They were set up as the example to the rest of the world by God. And knowest his will. In other words, you know what God wants. And approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. In other words, they got what they, what they believed out of the Bible, out of the law, the ten, uh, out of the first five, five books of Moses. Verse 19, And art confident that thou thyself art guide to the blind. In other words, we're the ones that are supposed to lead the rest of the world to show them who God is. And light of them which are in darkness. In other words, anybody that's outside of the law, according to the Jew, is in darkness. Verse 20. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has from a form of knowledge and of truth in the law. Thou therefore, which teachest another, teachest not thyself. Here's the rub. Thou that preachest that a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? And they were. Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Do they start believing false gods? Yes. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, though breaking the law dishonorest thou God? In other words, you say you believe the law, but you break the law, and you're dishonoring God. You're not giving him the glory. You're not obeying him. You're not doing what he tells you to do. Verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is uncircumcision. In other words, look, you say you follow the law, you believe the law, but if you break the law, who are you? What are you? You're nothing. You're a hypocrite. And by their hypocrisy, they cause the enemies of God to blaspheme, cause the Gentiles to blaspheme. Well, what do I need God for? You don't live any different than I do. <laughs> I know him. He says he's a Christian, but he does everything I do. Oh, he may go to church on Sunday, but what difference does that make? His, his God's not doing anything for him. Why do I need to believe him? And they won't trust Jesus Christ because they don't see it. Now, I'm not talking about, I mean, everybody gets this thing where, well, we need lifestyle evangelism. No, we just need people living for God is what we need. If you live for God, then your words will match your talk. Now, lifestyle evangelism says that the only way that you could really reach them is by showing them, not telling them. I'm telling you, you need to tell them and show them. You can't be a hypocrite. You can't be saying one thing and doing another. The church today is all talk and not enough show. They've adopted all the world's methods. They've adopted all the world's things and put it right into the church. So the church is no different than the world. I'm not talking about the expressions that people use. Oh, you know, you need to love Jesus. And if you just love Jesus and, and put your faith in him, he'll, 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 he'll take care of your life and everything will be wonderful. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the truth of the scriptures. We're talking about living, abiding by the standards that God sets up in the word of God. 
I'm not talking about man-made standards. I'm not talking about, quote, church standards. I'm talking about the standards that are found in the Word of God. We need to start living like Christians and being different from this world. And what the church as a whole is doing is they're trying to get as close to the world as they possibly can without stepping over the line. And unfortunately, as you know somebody that's ever walked a picket fence and you're standing on top of there and you're trying to balance, you know what? You lose your balance. Sometimes you fall off on one side. Sometimes you fall off on the other. And when you're trying to walk too close to the world, you're going to end up falling off into the world. And what kind of example are you going to be? Look, I know we all sin and we all have problems, but I tell you what, it should be the life goal to do the right thing, to be a testimony to this world. We need to live right. The problem with the world is a problem with Christians living in this world today is they're trying to fit in. They're trying to make it so that they will they won't uh, uh, how shall I say, look different and be odd and weird and crazy to this world. And I'm telling you that that's exactly what they're looking for. They're looking for something that will give them purpose. Why do you think they go after all these cults? Why do you think they go off in some of these wild, crazy things, you know, David Koresh and some of these other communes and things like that? People are looking for something that demands something of them not accommodates the lifestyle that they're already living, just putting the name of Jesus on it. That's not what it's about. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. We are supposed to be different than this world. And as a young Christian, I know that sometimes it's cloudy and it's hard to figure that thing out. But you ought to be in church well enough and long enough and get into your Bible well enough and long enough to figure out that what you've done in your past is not right. You ought to go through those lists of, of sins there and things that God wants you to get rid of in Colossians chapter 3 and, and Mark chapter 7 and some of those other, th those other lists that are there in, in Paul's writings and find out what's right and find out what's wrong. Stop playing around with the world. Stop playing around with the world's music. Stop playing around with the world's entertainments. Find out what God wants you to do and live for Him. Unfortunately, and, and the sad fact of the matter is, is that this world is so far gone because Christianity has taken them down the road so far that now they're, they're so blasphemous in, in their treatment of God, they will not give God the glory. They've been told so long that they've come from a rock and come from apes that they have no realization that the God of this universe is interested in them personally. And the testimony of preachers and the testimony of Christian workers and the testimony of Christians going out and living just like the world and committing all the wicked and horrendous things and heinous things that are out there in the world, whether it's pedestry or whether it's adultery and fornication and all that kind of stuff is going on. It's given the church a bad name and the world doesn't want to have anything to do with it and they blaspheme God because of the church. You need to live right. You need to make the change. The answer is to expose yourself to the book. And with a willing heart and a willing mind and a desire to please God, you can make the changes that are necessary. It's not impossible. Look, I, I tell you what, if, if I can grow as much as I have grown from what I was, uh, there's a God in heaven. And He's willing to work in you and through you. You just have to be willing to let him work. And not shut those things off when the Lord says, uh, that thing right there, you know, you shouldn't be watching that TV program. That's just glorifying sex. Or that's just glorifying evolution. Or that's just glorifying anything that does not give God the glory. You need to watch that stuff. The answer is in the book. We need to live for God. We need to give him the glory. I'll finish with this. We began the service with it, with the song that we sang. The first song, it says, To God be the glory, 
great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. To God be the glory. Let us not be guilty of blasphemy. Let us not be guilty of hypocrisy causing this world to blaspheme God because of our actions. Let us do the right thing. Let's go ahead and stand. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Take a moment here just to be silent. Let the Lord God minister to your heart. Maybe you ought to ask yourself a question. Am I guilty of causing the world to blaspheme God? Am I living in such a way that would cause them to blaspheme God because they see me as a hypocrite? That's something that only you can answer for yourself. I can't do that for you. You have to do that for yourself. And once you make, uh, make some determination in your heart and mind, then you need the will to, to change it, to do something about it. Take some time. Get a hold of the Lord. Find out what He wants. Get into the book. Say, okay, Lord, I'm going to look at those lists and find out what things I am guilty of. And by the grace of God, I want to change them. Do something about it. Don't just go status quo. God forbid that we should do something that causes the world to blaspheme God because of us. Father, I ask, Lord, that you would please take the words of this message and embed them into our heart and pray that they'd not be forgotten uh, at all, Lord. Pray that we would remember them in the days and weeks to come. Lord, that we do some self-examination. Lord, uh, that you do a work in our hearts and our minds, our spirit, that we would uh, make the changes necessary that would please you that would give you the glory, that we would not be guilty of causing someone else to blaspheme you. Help us by your grace. Fill us with your spirit. Lord, we can do this through Christ, which strengthen us. Lord, this is not an impossible task. God, you're a good God. You're a loving God. You want us to succeed. You want to help us, Lord. So God, I pray that you would... Help us to want to be helped, Lord, that we might live for you the, all the days of our life till you come. For we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Lord bless.